All right, cheers. Hi, everyone. So yeah, like I was just said, I'm here to talk about some game physics, some game stuff. Uh, it's the boring part, so we're not going to talk about games, but about making games. So sorry about that. And it's also a talk about ReasonML, that new hip language from Facebook, and reprocessing. Uh, more on that later. So I tricked you into coming here, and it's not actually a React talk. Oh, sorry about that. So again, hey, I'm Phil, Phil Plüktun, uh, hard to pronounce, so don't worry about it. I work for Formidable uh, in London, and you might know us from libraries like Spectacle or Victory or other libraries like that in open source. We have offices in Seattle, London, Denver, and so on. Um, there's still New York on there. That's technically not true anymore. And like I said, I work in London, and we're currently hiring. So if you want to work in London, in the UK, or Seattle, just come talk to me, and I'll put you in touch, or check out our website. Uh, obviously, Brexit, but we can work something out. <laughs> so today, I have a little story. Uh, I little story to tell about that time where we went to Seattle. So like I said, our company is based in Seattle, so our headquarters are there. So every year, we actually go there with everyone from the US, and we meet all of the US people and all of our remote workers, so the entire London office goes there. Uh, so in February, we traveled to uh, Seattle from London, and we called it Formidable Gathering, The Gathering. So now, we were, we were discussing what we would do. The flight was uh, eight or nine hours long. Uh, I don't quite remember how long exactly. So we were sitting in a restaurant, our favorite restaurant, Nando's. They have great chicken, uh, besides the point. And we were discussing what shall we do for these eight hours, because they're a little long, and we don't want to just waste them and be unproductive. So we wanted to find some fun, fun things to do. So you might already suspect what kind of the idea was. We were saying, obviously, so with eight hours, let's do a hackathon on the plane. So a flight hackathon, and we have eight hours to just build a game. So everyone got some ideas together. Some chose to use React Native, some React. And we were just planning out some different game ideas. And everyone was individually working on them, eight hours. And at the end of the flight, it had to be done. So my first mistake, um, obviously, was ag agreeing to this madness. Because why would anyone do this in eight hours? Also, I mean, don't need to sleep, right? You're on the plane for eight hours. It's not like you want to sleep, right? And so during that time, I saw this awesome video, this awesome video from these two guys who were making a game engine called Reprocessing for ReasonML. And at that time, I already heard about ReasonML and new cool language from Facebook, pretty functional, but pretty pragmatic. And they live streamed kind of a two hour session of them making the game Flappy Bird. Um, so I thought if they can make Flappy Bird in two hours, it shouldn't be too hard to achieve a nice and easy game in eight hours, right? It's like four times, four times longer. Um, so before we jump into that, so I was pretty intrigued by Reason back then. And I haven't really done a lot in Reason. So to tell you more about that, it's an effort by Cheng Lo at Facebook. And basically, there are two underlying projects there. There's first the ReasonML project, which is the actual language, and the buckle script, language, uh, the buckle script compiler, which is actually responsible for making it a transpile to JS language. And if you peek over to the left there, it also says a camel. So the interesting thing about Reason is that it's not a completely new language, but it's actually building on this language from 1996, which has been around for a while, and which is actually not that dissimilar from JavaScript in that it's also a multi-paradigm language. So you can write imperative code or very functional code if you're into that. Um, the O stands for objective. So you can still deal with all your data structures very efficiently. It's a very expressive language. And most importantly, they promise it to be safe. So it's a strongly typed language. So having worked a lot with Flow and TypeScript, 
and hearing about what other people are doing with Elm and PureScript, I was pretty intrigued by the idea of working with a language that was completely safe, that was strongly typed, where a number cannot suddenly become a string. And if you look at this language, it might seem really foreign to us as JavaScript developers. So if you haven't done any other language that is of a kind of an ML language, then this syntax might look very far from what JavaScript looks like. So a camel has types as well, so that, that's fine. Down there you can see a function. And this defines two types, a leaf and a node, and um, has 42 searches the value 42 in this tree. Uh, to make this a little more opaque, here's the same thing in Flow. So instead, I have a small object. There can be a tree. Um, so you have the type node, which can hold more of the type tree. And you have a leaf somewhere in there. And so we're just recursively calling has 42 and iterating through that tree until we reach our value. And we check whether it's 42. So as we can see, if we if we kind of, kind of like, close our eyes a little and we kind of squint back and forth. No, no, okay. They're not they're not very similar languages. Just checking. But if we look at ReasonML being built on the Kaya or Camel tool chain, um, what they've made here with ReasonML is they've made an effort to bring the language closer to JavaScript. So while a lot of the patterns that you see in ReasonML are very similar to JavaScript, the syntax itself is the only thing that is far from it. But if you look at this same code, you can kind of see that we have a similar definition of a structure, so we have leave and node here, which are not objects, but type constructors. So basically just tuples with a name. And down there, we're just uh, defining this recursive function. And if you look at that function definition, apart from the RAC, rec, which, uh, which means recursive there, it's fairly similar to JavaScript. And Last but not least, you have that small switch statement in there, but instead of having cases, it actually applies pattern matching. So in this example code, I can just write leave and node, and I can just check whether they are of these types. So strong types, pattern matching, pretty exciting. Uh, so just to summarize, ReasonML, it's like OCaml and JS had a baby, and the kind of things that brings to the table are it's a language that compiles to JavaScript, but also you can compile it to bytecode, so a small VM, or you can compile it to just native code. And again, everything's strongly typed, so you can write very safe code and be confident in it, confident in it. and it has inference, which means, uh, like in Flow, it's not necessary to define your types everywhere. It's not necessary to annotate your code like crazy. So if we then go to how how this is compiled. If we look at the Buckle script compiler, when it takes reason code and it spits out JavaScript, that code stays relatively sane and readable. Readable in the sense that sometimes it will be what you'd write exactly. And in this case here, it's somewhere in between. You can see it does tail call optimization. So you have a while loop here and it's optimized that, that uh, recursiveness away. Uh, our types are obviously completely gone. Instead, it's looking at something called tag and down there, you can see it's doing an array access, which basically just means every time we create one of these type constructors and it holds a value like a tuple, it actually creates an array and not an object. So long story short, buckle script output can be sane, can sometimes be a bit farther from what you'd write, but it always ends up being fairly readable JavaScript. So there's also BSB native, which is that part of buckle script that compiles to native code. So I was pretty excited because for a game, that might mean that you could take that game, you can write it once, and you can not only run it on the web, but maybe even on iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, and so on. So obviously, next mistake, I was writing this game in eight hours, and I was like, I, I'm not going to use JavaScript, or I'm not going to write this on React or React Native. I'm just going to write it with this hip new language that I don't even know yet. So first thing, the first intuition, the first thing that you do, obviously, is you go on Twitter and you tell everyone. Uh, it's like, uh, yeah, I'm going to get all set. I'm preparing some, some artwork, some assets for the game. Two mistakes here already. 
I thought <laughs> the artwork is obviously half the work. So if I have that before the flight, the code is just going to be like done in like half the time, easy. And obviously, setting expectations on Twitter was good idea. Um, so next next part of the story, but you might ask, th then it went well, right? Because like I can somehow make this work in eight hours. Uh, no. So two days later, we were boarding the flight. Everyone had their great game idea. There was a memory idea. There was an idea for a small, like top-down, like kind of movement game with robots. And meanwhile, I was still very firm on using reprocessing. So the great thing about reprocessing is that it's uh, like inspired the processing library, very simple and easy to use for 2D drawing. Um, so if you just look at one of the examples on the repo, it seems very easy. So you have a setup function, you can specify how large your canvas size is, your window size, so 200 by 200 in this case, and then you have a draw loop, and that draw loop repeats at 60 frames per second and draws exactly what you tell it to draw. So you have your black background here, uh, you set the fill color to red, and then you draw a rectangle. And just as a note, if you have done processing, this might really remind you of it. You have a lot of imperative methods that basically just bridge over to GL, OpenGL, WebGL very easily. And you just have these small imperative functions like draw, rectangle, uh, triangle, and so on that just sort of draw shapes to the screen. So I was on the flight. I was, had a solid battle plan. Uh, one, have assets ready, check. Uh, two, write a physics engine. And three, uh, make the rest of the game, right? Uh, my expectation was, sure, I can ride like a 2D platformer, jump and run. Easy, eight hours. Um, second point, uh, write a physics engine? <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if you've studied physics, if anyone here has studied physics, but um, it turned out downloading a couple of articles from the internet is not the best idea when you want to write a physics engine. So fast forward to halfway through the flight. So after four hours, I was working on that game, writing reprocessing, had all my great assets, and had some results to show. Uh, that's what I had. You have that little character running. And oh! <laughs> Goes to space, right? Uh, but I still had the other half of the flight. So shortly before we arrived, I finally arrived at this. You can run now and... Oh. Well, oh. eight hours. Uh, if you if you like games, you'll enjoy this one. So, what went wrong? Um, ReasonML is a safe language, right? So, if we assume ReasonML is a safe language, how how come we can actually write unsafe code here? Clearly. We have set some constraints. The character follows some basic mathematical rules, and it cannot fall through the floor or not jump into space, right? Um, yeah, we have set all these constraints. So assuming we pick up some physics formula and we type them into that, uh, the code itself is still safe. But even if we guarantee strong type safety, that doesn't mean your code is necessarily correct. In my case, that meant that all the bugs that you've seen mainly came from floating point errors. And boy, those are fun. <laughs> Turns out uh, that when you do physics and the numbers get increasingly inaccurate, you actually don't get the result that you expect. And when you expect something to be pushed in the opposite direction because it's hitting an object, floating point errors can make it slowly sift through that object like a liquid. So anyway, um, so I had at the end of this, a half-working physics engine, uh, but at least I could run it on Mac and iOS and Windows and so on. Great. And I eventually got it to work, the entire physics engine, and you can check it out on GitHub, but uh, that was a week later. It's a bit more than eight hours. It's more like 50. Um, so no matter what new language you use, it turns out 
you can still mess up even if that, la that language is really type safe, strongly typed, has great inference, looks awesome. But ReasonML was still really fun to use. So I couldn't show you a working physics engine today because clearly I'm inept at math. But I didn't want to let you all down. Uh, so mm, I brought something else today. So now, if we if we summarize what we've been through, um, I've now shown you ReasonML, which uses Buckle script to compile via the OCaml compiler to JavaScript or native code. Um, and I thought, I don't really have anything to show, but what, what if we make this a little more fun? And uh, it turns out I lied in the beginning. There, there is some React in this talk. So I thought, what if we take React and JSX and then we pipe that through ReasonML, and then through Bucket Script, and then over Camel, and then to JS and Native. So how can we make this even weirder? So it turns out that um, Reason uh, has a fairly solid React implementation, be meaning bindings to the actual React libraries. Um, so like flow bindings, it provides typings to React. Apart from that, there is a slightly different API, and you check can check that out on the Reason React website. And this is officially maintained, and Facebook is themselves using that to build a couple of apps. And if we look at that, and if we can squint a little, then maybe we can kind of see your normal React class. So, you, so in here, you create this module image. You call this function called stateless component, and it gives you back some kind of template to create that component. So the make function then is kind of treated like if you would call do on a class. And then we have that render method there. We can render to the DOM. So we can render, in this case, an image tag. So not going into the details, there are a lot of kind of little little tricks and tips in Reason React and Reason themselves to make this work better. But this is kind of the syntax that is similar enough to React to actually work in Reason. And you have JSX built into the language. Um, so I thought. Why not make something that can take JSX and components and render to reprocessing? So similar example to before, um, you have this module example. You, again, have reason react stateless component. But in the render method now, I'm just writing this, this little element called rect, so rectangle. And that just translates to an actual rectangle that is drawn in reprocessing. And I've made a quick library for this, and this library is called Moomin, because we have two Finnish people in the London office now, and I can't escape the Finnish culture, which is great. Licorice is disgusting there. So this library, this library is that small wrapper that allows you to write components in JSX to actually build 2D games. And if I can find my mouse cursor, if I can find my mouse cursor, I've got a little demo here on Code Sandbox. Thankfully, you can now use the uh, Code Sandbox containers, in case you missed it, to build any kind of code on Code Sandbox on an actual container, so speaking, server. And in this case, I have this library here, this Moomin library. And this actually renders out a Moomin, just that instead of writing um, actual reprocessing code, we are writing an actual component that eventually calls render, has an image here and renders that Moomin. And the nice thing about that is that, like in, like in React, this brings some kind of um, state properties to reprocessing that allow you to write a very simple game, but keep the code clean and keep everything contained inside separate components. So instead of having a stateless component as before, I have this thing called a reducer component. That means, like you'd expect, there is a reducer in here, and it's like a small implementation of Redux in that it receives actions and changes its state. But I'm just going to add this will update method here. And I have this small rotate value. And every time we render, so six times a second, we're going to increment that by 0 0.01, which is basically just guesswork. And if I apply that, we should get the movement to spin. Huzzah! Or we'll spin it a little faster. So when I said demo, this appears to be a real demo, but I don't trust myself live coding this. Oh, well. 
Anyway. So in, in conclusion, <laughs> reason, reason turns out to be exciting for many use cases. And while I really messed up that physics engine, it is still great for writing games. And you can write it imperatively with free processing, or more like React with the library I've just shown. It also turns out um, OCaml and Reason are really great for writing parsers. So if you ever wanted to write a small parser for your own language, if you're crazy like me, you can write parsers in Reason that read themselves a lot nicer than if you'd write them in JS. It's also really great, obviously, for writing uh, React apps. So Reason React is a great resource to write your React apps um, like Elm in a type-safe environment. Turns out for more functional kind of applications, Reason is also a great language. So if, you, if you're into observables, you can also use stream-like libraries inside Reason and those feel very nice because of built-in language features, simple ones like piping or currying built into the language. If this works. And the other side of things is, while, while it might be awesome, it's hard to tell whether it will actually be a popular language. Yes, it's built by Facebook or at Facebook rather, but you can't really tell whether it's going to stay or going to go away or actually going to be used for React or actually going to be used for, I don't know, these simple 2D games. Uh, but that also means there's no one that's going to judge your code. There, there aren't like a hundred thought leaders on Twitter who are going to yell at you like, oh, you can't do that in React. No, component will unmount, component will mount, component will mount will go away, something like that. That just doesn't exist in Reason yet. So you can write some shitty Reason code and no one will complain. So that's great. Um, I have a short list here of a couple of these libraries that I've talked about including reprocessing and Reason React especially. Also the libraries that I've made with Reason. So here you have that Moomin library for React like 2D games. Uh, I also wrote a CSS in JS parser if you're into parsers or a library for observables if you're into that. There's way more resources on uh, Reason. And right now, Reason is very fun to write. But like Kitsa said, you don't really have to move on to the next big thing just yet if you don't want to. And that's it. Thank you.